Regarding churches, what, what is your advice for people who are looking for a church, a good church? What are the marks of a good church? What are the marks of godly elders and godly preachers? Um, and what are the roles of believers in a church? To what extent do they submit to elders? Yeah, <clears throat> the situation is so bad in Christendom today that in most places in the whole world, I think 99% of places, it's very difficult to find a godly church and godly elders. <clears throat> so you have to make do with whatever is available. Find your comfort in this, that you don't need 2,000, 3,000 people to have a church. You don't even need 20 or 30. You need only two or three. Jesus said, Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Gathered together does not mean they themselves gather together. No, not read carefully, not where two or three gather together, but where they are gathered together by the Holy Spirit. So a church is where God, through the Holy Spirit, brings two or three to people together under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Not just a few Christians in a place say, hey, let's meet together. Say, Lord, you're in our midst. Maybe he's not in their midst. But where the Holy Spirit gathers, that's how it was with us 46 years ago when we started in Bangalore. The Holy Spirit brought some of us together and from that a church grew. Now, if you don't find a church like that, <clears throat> meet with those who are, who you know, who know the Lord the best that you know in your locality. If nobody else, then your own family. And if no one in your family is converted, then pray that God will give you someone. We used to pray that in the early days. Lord, is there anybody in this area who's seeking for a godly life? Bring us in touch with that person. Maybe I'll meet the person in the store or in the bank or somewhere. <clears throat> Somehow, bring me in touch with them. I prayed that for 45 years. That's how I come in touch with people all over the world. He brought me in touch with people through the YouTube, through the internet. Initially, by meeting somebody in a store or a bank or in the school or somewhere. <clears throat> so, but if you don't pray that prayer, the Lord, shows you, Lord sees you're not interested at all. If you don't have a passion to build a church, God's not going to work for you at all. Just forget it. I had a passion. I had a passion for 10 years to see a New Testament church before I actually saw it. It was like carrying a baby in my womb. I don't have a spiritual womb I mean, in my heart. I carried a baby in my heart. Lord, I want to see a New Testament church. I want to see a New Testament church. For 10 years before I actually saw it. From 1965 to 1975. Many mistakes I made, but finally God granted my heart's desire. So if you continuously say, Lord, you said the church of Jesus Christ is the only thing that's going to remain when the world is destroyed. Like Noah had a passion to build the ark. Ah, there were so many other interesting projects, uh, housing project, building project, and so many other projects. Noah said, no, I don't, it's good, but I don't have time for it. The ark is the primary thing. And I'll take care of my family, make sure they are fed, and uh, I'll build the ark, <clears throat> and nobody's going to finance it, so I'll sell some of my lands and buy money and build the ark. That's how Noah built it. Do you have a passion to build a church where you're willing to spend your own money that's what the Lord asked me. You want to get finance from others? No. <clears throat> I'm, I've never taken one cent from my church in Bangalore for 45 years. I supported myself and served the Lord. And I got an example from Noah, who built the ark. You know, when the Lord told him to build the ark, the, he never asked Noah, Lord, where is the money going to come from? That's the question many people ask today, the Lord. You want me to do this for you, Lord? Where is the money going to come from? Why didn't Noah ask that? Because he knew what God would say. Noah, sell your lands. I've made you rich. Sell your land and get some money and build my ark. How many of you are willing to do that to build a church? I tell you, God will do a miracle through you. And uh, I've seen that. I said, Lord, I will serve you at my own expense. I will never in my life, in all these 50 and more years I've served the Lord, I've never sent out a report about my work or asked anybody for money. And I never will. I don't get one cent, no royalty from any of my books because I don't publish books to make money. Paul did not write letters to make money. <clears throat> it's very important if you have that attitude, I believe God will help you. 
So that's how it's been. <clears throat> we have tried to put the Lord first and his principles. Jesus never asked anybody for money. He never gave a report of his work to anybody to get money. That is where, this is where I disagree with 99% of Christian work today. And people may call me a heretic if they like, but it's a good type of heresy to believe in, to follow Jesus in the way he lived and the way he worked in everything. And you, I, I say that there'll be very few people like that, but God's given me some amazing co-workers in all these years. Amazing co-workers, 50 to 100 of them, who follow the same principle. So God has people, but he has to lead you to them. And among those, some are very sacrificial. They are the ones whom God uses the most. The others are just nominally elders of a church and just go along with our CFC doctrine. We just follow it and nothing happens there. This is nom there are some nominal CFC churches. Nothing happens because they're, they're no, they don't have good leaders. They're nominal elders. But I thank God for those who have got a spirit of sacrifice. So if you want to build a church for the glory of God, you have to have the spirit that David had in 2 Samuel 24, verse 24, which says, I will never offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. God gave me that verse 60 years ago. 2 Samuel 24, 24. I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. And the Lord said to me, never offer a sacrifice to me which has cost you nothing. I want to ask all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, you're living for the Lord. What has it cost you? What has it cost you in terms of money? What has it cost you in terms of your reputation? What has it cost you in terms of losing the friendship of people because you stand up for the Lord, maybe your relatives, etc.? If it has cost you nothing, then don't be surprised if nothing has come out of your life also. And nothing will come out of your life in the next few years also. Because the principle is, you cannot offer to the Lord that which costs you nothing. If you go like that, you'll get nothing. Don't be surprised. Don't think that you can just tag on to some godly man and uh, get a reputation. The Pharisees said, oh, we belong to Abraham. John the Baptist said, don't talk all that nonsense. So <clears throat> to build a church is very easy if you're willing to sacrifice. It's very easy if you're willing to sacrifice anything. God will build a church through you, however weak you are. What were those Peter, James, and John and all? Fishermen who knew nothing. They didn't know even know the Bible. God used them to build a church that lasted for 20 centuries. So what type of man of God should, should we be if we are elders? Jeremiah chapter 3. He says here about shepherds. Jeremiah 3.15. I will give you shepherds after my own heart. And they will feed you with understanding. A true elder is one who is understanding God's heart and trying to have the same heart. I have sought to have that the heart of forgiveness, the heart of strictness, the heart of compassion, and the heart of helping those who are in need, spiritually, financially, physically, every way. So that's the type of leader. And if you don't find one like that, say, Lord, lead me to someone like that, or make me one like that, so that I can help others. But a good prayer to begin with is this, even if you're all alone, Lord, is there somebody, one person in my area, this area with whom I can meet regularly? One who, you've got to lead me, Lord, to the right person. And when you get two, then make it three. And if those of you are single, be very careful that you don't marry the wrong person. Because then you won't be able to do God's will or God's will the way he wants it. I was, you know, I was so scared that I might accidentally say yes to some girl in a moment of weakness and marry her. That I pray some desperate prayers. I say, Lord, if I ever do such a stupid thing that I said yes to some girl who is not your will for me, on the day of the wedding, send an earthquake and disturb the wedding and break it up. I prayed some radical prayers like that. But fortunately, there was no need for an earthquake because God led me to the right person. And I proved that in the last 53 years. Being a co-worker with me, just like if I had James Peter or John with me to build a church. So if you are sincere and eager, I believe God will lead you in all these things.